Well, um, hello everyone. This is incredibly exciting. This is the first time we have an event at Wearers Festival where we actually are in the flesh with our guest speaker and with some of the members of uh, Wearers Festival community. So this is really, really cool. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in um, this evening with us. Um, we have Claire Wilcox here. Uh, just a uh, short introduction before uh, starting this conversation. Uh, Wearers Festival is a nonprofit organization based in London, uh, founded by Vanessa and uh, myself. And Wearers Festival is all about exploring Londoners and what they wear and the meanings of dress and the relationship really? between dress and identity. So my name is Nao and I am a fashion curator. And this is my co-founder, Vanessa, who is also a fashion curator. Um, so today we are here to talk about Claire Wilcox's book, Patchwork, Life Amongst Clothes, which this year won the Penn Ackerley Award for 2021. So congratulations, Claire, for that. Much. Um, I'm going to just briefly read Claire's bio. So Claire Wilcox has been senior curator of fashion at the Victoria and Albert Museum since 2004. She has staged many successful exhibitions for the museum, including Radical Fashion, Vivian Westwood, The Art and Craft of Gianni Versace, The Beauty, and Frida Kahlo. I'm sorry, The Beauty, Golden Age of Couture, Paris and London, 1947 to 1957, Alexandra McQueen, Savage Beauty, and Frida Kahlo, Making Herself Up. She instigated Fashion in Motion, live catwalk events in the museum in 1999. She is the professor in fashion curation at the London College of Fashion and is on the editorial board of Fashion Theory, the Journal of Dress, Body and Culture. Claire lives in London and is available for interview and written pieces. Um, I'm just gonna give a short bio of the book that we've all read. In Patchwork, Claire Wilcox gives insight into the mind of a curator, stepping into the archive of objects and the archive of memory. She stitches together her expert knowledge of fashion from courtly history to modern haute couture, with the story of her own life to create a patchwork of reflections, her mother's black wedding suit, the Delphos gowns stored in her favorite archive in the museum, the fairy wings her daughter wore in hospital, her aunt's handmade blue and white gingham bikinis, and printed English cotton dresses from the 1830s. As a curator, Claire makes sense of the inscrutable rem remnants of past lives, both the commonplace and the remarkable objects that have survived to the present day. Patchwork celebrates how clothes allow us to fashion ourselves and are woven through with memory. So the first question is, um, when and why did you decide to write this? Wait there, oh, before we start with the questions, there's this <laughs> one question that we always, always ask to all of our guest speakers in every event we do at Wearers Festival, because we're all about what are we all wearing? And we want to know, what are you wearing today? And we, you can do a little show and tell, because you know you brought like a very special piece of fabric uh, to share with us. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not wearing the objects I've brought with me. I'm wearing functional, tough clothes to get through a tough day's work at the museum. Um, but the object I brought with me is an obi. It's um, a Japanese sash that goes around a kimono. And I wouldn't presume to wear it because you'd have to wear everything that goes with it. But it means a lot to me because it was given to me very recently by a dear friend who, um, he's a potter, um, but he lived in Japan for many years and his late wife collected uh, Japanese textiles, but not the courtly, brightly colored um, kimono that we, we think we know about, but more functional country weaving. And this is hand woven. And when I first, um, when he first gave it to me, I said, this is so special, you know, and he said, well, you know, um, he knew I'd appreciate it. And as I looked at it, I thought at first it was um, an interesting weave, but then I realized there's sort of little glints of metal thread in it, which you probably can't see. But this suggests to me that if this was country wear, then it was very special country wear, and maybe there's a deeper story in there, but I'm still learning 
about um, this kind of weaving and this kind of Japanese garment. So every time I get something new, I'm, I'm learning something new. And I'm going to be asking curators at the BA and looking at under a thread counter, which magnifies the, the threads. But it's very beautiful and very long and a little bit, I mean, I thought about trying to wear it tonight. I thought, no, that's a really bad idea. So um, here it is. Do you have a kimono and have you tried it on with? I don't have, I do have a kimono, but I haven't got the right kind of kimono and it would pain me to put two wrong things together. So yeah. no, no, it's just a, a really beautiful thing in its own right. It's very heavy and very tactile. Mm -hmm. So that's my object. Amazing, thank you so much for bringing it. Have you done, you said you like take it to the VNA and as a curator, so if they know anything about it, have you found any interesting facts about it? Not yet. Not no, yet. I've just been given it and I thought, well, this is the top of my list of research to do. And, you know, what we do with the research into fashion and dress and textiles, you know, how we use it may come up in years. You know, it, it's not, I mean, when you sort of accrue knowledge about textiles and fabric, it can sometimes get buried in the threads of the, of the past or get overwhelmed by your current projects. And my current project is about menswear, so it's not exactly relevant, but um, I never think research like that is wasted. And I really, I really do love those distractions that you get when you're doing research and you're supposed to be looking at one book and you end up looking at another and then three hours have gone by. And, but, but it's all really important. Yes. And eventually everything ends up having like a place. It may not be in that project, right? But maybe exactly. later. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Thank you for bringing that. Um, so why and when did you decide to write this book? I can tell you when. That's mm -hmm. relatively easy. I started in about 2015 because after the Alexander McQueen exhibition, I had a sabbatical for a year. And, and I didn't really use it terribly wisely in some ways. Perhaps, that, perhaps it was wise doing, um, you know, I feel guilty if I'm not working and not researching. But I realised after a few months that actually what I was doing was preparing myself to take on or embark on a different kind of writing, different way of um, articulating my relationship with objects and with history and with clothing and with memory. And so it just began very, very slowly. And I wrote it whenever I had spare moments, um, probably took about six years. Why I wrote it, I think I was just looking for a, a, different, a different sort of medium to express my interest in memory in particular, and the threads of memory. And my, my day job, or two, two jobs, because I have two jobs, didn't really, didn't really allow for that kind of personal writing. And so it started off as a private project and then it just built up. And I showed it to a few people and, you know, they said, please write more, you know, what you're going to do with it. And, um, and then I found an agent who found a publisher and, and it suddenly began, you know, to roll forward and to become something more than the sum of its parts. I didn't really, I didn't really realise I was writing memoir, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I thought I was just writing fragments of memory. And it's lovely because this type of writing, this form rather, is the first in its discipline. When we talk about um, fashion, it's not usually written in this creative writing style. No, I mean, there's lots of clothing and fashion in lots of memoirs and autobiographies because mm -hmm. it is so important. So you do, you, you know, it crops up all the time, but it's not foregrounded in the way I foreground it and I think that it was it was a very useful very useful sort of mechanism for me to interrogate memory sometimes you know joyful sometimes difficult memories but also to think really carefully about you know why does clothing mean so much to us why are we so bewitched by it you know what is this power but then why do we also become inordinately fond of a sort of, in my case, a, um, I've kept a, a cardigan of, of my father's. I actually 
one day or a couple of years ago, I thought it must be strong. So I put it in the bag for the charity shop and it was being collected and they, they took the chair, they took the bag. And as they're about to drive off, I ran, I ran off and said, stop, stop, I want that card come back. Um, so I still got it. I wasn't ready to let it go. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, so Claire, we, we all know that we are, you're a curator and you've been working in the VNA for quite a long time. You've written several curatorial texts, academic texts, uh, but this is a different, a very different kind of writing, isn't it? So I wonder, how did you feel writing this? Is this so different to what you usually write? And if you can take us through your journey, writing patchwork. Um, it's amazing the amount of detail you can remember from like, many years ago. Like, did you have to do research on your own, the, your own art and photographies? And did you have conversations with like family or friends to remember all these things? Or is all is there in your head? I think everybody asked you like three different questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, let me take them in order. So the, the first thing you asked me about was the difference between this and my academic or curatorial writing. Yes, the re result is different, but actually in many ways, the process does have, have some similarities. So. Um, when I when I wrote the original, if you saw the original versions of these pieces, you probably would be quite surprised they ended up as they did. So they're distillations. So for every, say, short piece that may have three or four paragraphs, it started off pages and pages. And I just edited it, distilled it, um, made it more specific, but Not, not vaguer in terms of the writing. So the writing is very particular and I'm very particular about language and I do enjoy stringing words together. And I read a lot. I, I really enjoy reading prose and poetry and historical texts. But when I was writing it, it was really important to me that if I was going to delve into the realm of the personal, then the writing had to be really rigorous. It, it would, I would not have been happy to have submitted the pieces as they were first written. So the similarity is that when I'm writing text for exhibition and also for museum publications, I will write masses. I'll do loads of this research, write lots, and then I will narrow it down. It's it, every word has got to count. You, you've, I, I don't, I mean, it's like an exhibition you've got to edit the objects down, it's got to be purposeful. So that's a similarity. But then in terms of doing research for this, not at all. No, because it was all in my memory. And in fact, when I was writing about some objects, which I still had, they're in the house. I didn't even need to go and look at them because I'd memorized them. I've got a terrible memory for names and dates and you know, get really confused with numbers absolutely you know mathematics you know, I found it difficult. but I can remember objects that I've seen once maybe 25 years ago in the archive and I could describe them to you in great detail so the things I had I got a crystal clear memory of them even though it might when they've long gone wow that might definitely make sense <laughs> so you have a photographic memory then I guess that's what it's called yes but it's funny because when I'm when I'm thinking about objects that I've seen, and I, I, I could almost sort of replay, you know, so then you look at the outside and then you open the inside and then I can sort of almost memorize the stitching, the interior of the garments as well. So it's like- So your memory has a recording. It's got a recording, yes, exactly. <laughs> but you're, sh you're surely the same as curators, you must. Yes, I definitely have a photograph of memory as well. Yes, yes. I remember events based on the clothing I wear, yes. the people that I've seen. Yes, yeah, so it's a really useful way to to um, to to get access to the past. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so, speaking of your photographic memory, when writing the book, um, did you or before writing the book, were you aware of all of these memories? Not really. No, I was. I was very pleased that I didn't have to, 
to work too hard on researching because normally I would I would find it very difficult to write about a designer or a time in fashion history without reading pretty much every text um, there is out there. So it can take a really long time to research. But with this, the, the, the transference of my memory of, of an incident or my memory of an archive or memory of particular bits of clothing, I could describe them very easily and then, as I said, edit it right down. And I and I didn't, I didn't have to work hard at remembering. In fact, the more I wrote, the more I remembered. The hard work was in the editing. Yeah. Why do you think garments stick to our memories like that? Like almost like any other object, because when I was reading your book and you have all these like beautiful, beautiful fragments where you remember specific people in your life from your past by the clothes I used to wear. And it made me think a lot about my own history and my own family and like friends from the past and the clothes that I remember them by. And it's it's so funny. I mean, maybe it's, it's because we're very visual creatures, but what, what do you think clothes stick to us like that? And well, like, you know, fashion and clothing is a, is a really powerful force. And a colleague at work said to me the other day, she's not a historian, and she said that she spent her life trying to explain what I regard as very complex paintings. And then she said that you spent your life convincing people that what appears simple is very complex. And I think that that's the, that's the Trojan horse element of fashion and clothing and textiles, because, because they don't, because their, their place in society and in history in our lives is a given. It's one thing we all have in common. And because they played an equally important part in the lives of, say, people living in the 1850s or the 1750s, the 1650s, they, they become relegated to social objects rather than complex objects which bear their own histories. And all you've got to do is start looking in something like my Obi. You know, the next minute I'll be looking at, you know, Japanese society in the late, late 19th century. So they can, they, they lead you somewhere. And then from that, the interest unfolds. I never find that my work shuts, shuts something down. There's no, there's no end to it. It's always expanding, unfolding. And that's why I'm fascinated by it. And it also sounds like it represents a challenge, doesn't it? Because like, for example, us doing wearers and also from the perspective of, of fashion curation, we're always explaining people that are not necessarily into fashion why fashion is, is relevant and deep mm -hmm. and meaningful. Um, and I think one of the biggest achievements of your book is that it, it does that in a very accessible way. Like, anyone can enjoy it, it's, it's so beautifully done and it really makes people reflect on their own relationships with clothes and and we don't have to be preachy about it, like people people just get it, like giving the book to like several people to read, people that are not into academia, mm. not into fashion necessarily and they absolutely love it and they absolutely, they absolutely understand that clothes are very very important, they are not superficial things. But you see that the clothing in the book is is the mechanism by which the book as a piece of literature if i can call it that was written because when it was when my agent read it and then bloomsbury took it on they didn't regard it as as predominantly a piece of literature about clothing and fashion they regarded it as as well, they said, I, I can't say it to myself, but they said it was prose poetry. So in a way, it's, it's many different things. I think that the genesis was in the clothing and the fashion and the textiles and the memory, but the result is, um, again, if I can say this, is, is more than that. It, it's, become, it's become a piece of writing. And that was where I wanted to be. And the only way I could get there because I'm a creator and spent my life working with things is to go by the route of thread and textile and warp and weft. So uh, 
although the although the, the importance I don't underestimate the importance of the subject matter the end result I think I think what you're what, I'm agreeing with what you say because lots of people who've read it have really very little interest in clothing they're interested in writing but then others who are very into clothing love you know love the clothing bits yep yeah and what what I found so lovely about it is they're short and sweet mm -hmm. and you give just the right amount of information that pulls you in yes she's eloquently written um so as you know where's where's festival is a platform where we allow people to talk about their clothes and its links to culture and identity and that's the reason why we've invited you here today to talk about your book because you talk about your life amongst clothes so my question for you is what about clothes interests you so much what's so important about garments I'm going to throw that, to you? Yeah, let, let's throw that question open to the room yeah. because I, I would really like to know what everybody else thinks about about this. I mean, you know, would somebody else like to chip in? You're here because you think that clothes and fashion are important. I know the screen can't see you, but they will hear you. <laughs> yeah, they can yeah, hear you. you can speak up. I, I didn't know this was going to be recorded, actually. I'm like better on this side. <laughs> um, so uh, I studied fashion and before doing fashion, I was in fine art and in general, I've just always had a very big interest in history. So when doing art, you know, I really felt that, okay, this is fantastic. This is a piece, it's gonna go up, it's emotional, it's gonna mean something. But then when I tried making clothes, cause I learned how to knit first before then sewing and my grandma taught me. And my grandma uh, in Venezuela, she makes all of these only baby clothes and very thin crochet and every time you know a baby was gonna his baby's gonna be born of a friend or family or neighbor she makes and I was like wow that is so meaningful and is not just beautiful and aesthetic but it's practical somebody can wear it and can use it and that for me is what made me completely just change into fashion because I was like it's even more than a painting. You can wear it and it's exactly like a reflection of society because maybe you make a piece as a designer, but then somebody decides to wear it differently. So it just, it gives you so much information. It does, you're right, it's that information. Would anybody else like to? Yeah, I could go next. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess for me, it's just the simple fact that we're, we are always wearing dress, like we're always, dressed or never I get naked. We're wearers, we are, aren't we? Yeah. Such, wearers. such a good so, title for your, yes, your organization. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think because we're wearing like clothes all the time, we start like to develop complex relationships with our clothes, even though we don't always like realize it. We always know that we have these like connections to our clothes. And I guess for me personally, clothes and fashion um, they're important because they tell stories and I love stories mm -hmm. yeah and I just love how if I look at like a piece of clothing and then if I don't own it own it like for example if I look at it sorry <laughs> <laughs> I just like it makes me think uh, about like stories like where did you buy it from and even if I don't know the, the, the answers to these questions and even if I never ask them to the, the wearer I it like it still feels great to know that if I look at this, it's just so interesting to look at, and like it carries like memory and it carries like the personal history. I guess the history of a person. There's the very process. few disciplines that can operate on so many complex levels, from the purely commercial, um, with all the issues around sustainability that that entails to the intimate with the baby clothes that um, your relative knits. And so uh, for, for, for a subject that's so multifaceted, I think that may be one of the problems is that it, it won't stay in one place. And so it's very hard to assess its cultural and social value. And the worlds associated with fashion or clothing range from you know the, the massive history of the silk industry and the silk route through to um, mass-produced clothing in Italy through to handcrafted work. So it's such a broad subject. It's, it's kind of a, as broad as it can get because wherever there's society and communities, there's going to be clothing of some kind of the other. 
and I think that's why it's hard to pin it down and hard to hard to ascertain its its value. The other thing, of course, is that it changes the whole time. I mean, it's like picking up water, isn't it? If you're if you're trying to be a curator or a historian of contemporary fashion, you're always going to be a step behind. You, you know, that's that's the point of it, really, that it, it, it mutates constantly. And I think that's another reason, let's not say mutate, let's say it evolves constantly. I think that's another reason why it works so well on social media, because that's an ever evolving, um, restless discipline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think fashion is restless because we're always seeking some perfection. There's that, that's, there's so much of this in literature. I mean, there's a wonderful story by Virginia Woolf, which you probably all know, um, where yeah. Yeah, she, of course, um, you all know this. And we did a whole a, book club on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, the, but the point about it is that the, the hoped for transformation doesn't happen because the dress betrays her. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't realize until she gets to the party that it's a complete disaster. We've all been there. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it's very relatable. Yes, yes. Do you think, do you find that your job influences the way you dress? Um, a long time ago, when I started work at the VA under Valerie Mendes, who always wore black, apart from the odd splash of red or purple, and was immensely stylish. <laughs> But, but she she dressed in a very practical way, and she she said, you know, everybody thinks curators are, you know, going to be beautifully fashion curators going to be beautifully dressed. Well, we're on our hands and knees, moving mannequins around. We're in storerooms, climbing up ladders. We're doing you know, paperwork. It's really not an environment to dress up in. Mm -hmm. So, I and I've always really liked work clothes you know I like stout fabric I, I like I like clothes that have got a bit of a history of function mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. aprons and, you know denim. denim and nice boots you know that that can mm -hmm. I feel I can get on with my life I don't have to I don't want clothing I don't I don't want clothing to um let's say cramp my style <laughs> <laughs> I want my style to be my style and the clothing um, serves that. I don't, I don't want to be led by clothing. That's a very interesting approach and even more interesting considering that you're dealing all day with these absolutely gorgeous and glamorous pieces and spectacular things and there's even a part in your book when you mentioned that people tend to ask curators like do you ever feel tempted to put oh, things yes. on? <laughs> well, no I mean I have you <laughs> no, no. Well, I in the book I say no, and I hand on heart, I, I, I couldn't and wouldn't. Um, you know, I think, you know, dealing with that. Say you were a curator at the National Gallery dealing with paintings, you wouldn't expect to have those at home as well, would you? That concept. So I think we, we, we know that we're working with really top quality stuff from the past um, and the present. We know that we're collecting design that leads. We know that the lifestyle associated with, say, Christian Dior ball gown from the 1950s is not going to be a lifestyle that we're living. In fact, very few people, even at the time, live like that. Mm -hmm. But we also know that those examples have been above others because of the sheer beauty of the craft. I mean, the amount of hours invested in a couture gown, as you know, I mean, we're talking days, weeks, months, even. So I think anybody who owned that, however wealthy and privileged they were, would not want to be discarding it. They would keep it. And that's that's the museum's fortune, that those those pieces were kept and collected. And I think when Cecil Beaton was going to all his social circle collecting clothes for the um, fashion and um, and anthology exhibition in 1971, he, he had to sort of twist people's arms, you know, they were no longer wearing these things, but they didn't want to let them go. So just because they were in a privileged position of owning a couture, it still meant the same as our things mean to us. And um, 
yes, we've got lots of letters on file with people saying, oh, Cecil's been here and my wardrobe's empty, you know, he's taken everything from me, you know. But yeah, I, I think, I think curators, they're doing a job and it's a practical job. So, you know, not, not, not a reason to dress up to go to work particularly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're handling glamorous objects, but you can't be glamorous because no. it makes you less efficient. You can't walk yes. around, yes. you can't climb a ladder in high heels. No, plus I wouldn't know how, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think glamorous has ever been on the list of my, you know, <laughs> things I've aspired to. <laughs> And Claire, talking about collections, um, Patchwork addresses the topic of the practice of collecting uh, repeatedly uh, from the point of view of the museum, but also from the personal. And we want to ask you if you ever consider yourself a collector. Like you do mention that you have all these objects, you even have like a cabinet at home that you, your partner used to call the museum. Yes. Um, were you a collector? Are you a collector? Not, not really. I mean, I think I'm a mother, and I think that mothers tend to get attached to things associated with their children's mm -hmm. childhood. So, you know, I found it very difficult to let go of their baby teeth. So I've still got them in a jam jar at home, and they think it's really gruesome. <laughs> but um, there's many other sort of objects that are in the, mu in the museum, as we called it, that belong to them growing up. But there's also there's something about scale. I do quite like small things, and I wrote about very much liking um, the borrower's books when I was a child, Mary Norton's books about small people that live under the floorboards and take things. And if you lose things like a hairpin or a needle and you're thinking, where's it gone? The borrowers will have taken it. And I, I believed in them. <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely convinced. And so I, I really liked that idea of a small scale. And I wrote about it in a, um, column a few months ago in the, in the um, FT, actually, I think it was. And so I've, in, in this museum, which was really just a fairly small cupboard, it was you know, about that wide, a bit taller than me, I put small things as well because they get lost or the burrows take them <laughs> and I wanted to keep them. But I was a very careful child. And so I do have some things from my own childhood, which was not, I mean, it was not a particularly affluent childhood, but what I was given by my parents, by people. And actually, maybe, I remember people used to give me things when I was quite young, because they would say, we know you're very careful, we know you'll look after this. And, um, and I did. And so I still have those things, but you know, not a huge number, but enough to connect me with the childhood curator that was careful. And you ended up well, like, looking after super valuable stuff in yes. a museum, being Very like carefully. the gatekeeper, yeah, the guardian <laughs> of all these well, things. Well, not on my own. I mean, there's a whole institution. Um, I mean, there's a whole discipline, a, a curation that you know about, and that's to do with I mean, it's a, it's a kind of strange training because you you can train to be a curator academically, but I think the real training is in working with the objects and then you just sort of know. I mean, you know if an object's in trouble. You know if an object's been, or let's say, let's say a, a skirt or a dress or, or jacket, you know if it's been put in a drawer not carefully. Mm -hmm and you would rescue it, wouldn't you? You know, you'd know to put tissue paper between something that was sequined and something that was knitted. In fact, we never would, but you know, say for the sake of argument, you would know that sequins was stag the wool. So I think, I think if you're a person who's careful and you do care about your, your objects and your collection, then you sort of instinctively do the right thing. I mean, we do have training in how to handle objects and, um, you know, there's, it, there's different ways of handling different types of objects. And we happen to have a lot of ceramics in our home. And I learned long ago, you don't pick up a precious jar or a pot or a vase by the rim, do you? You know, and you don't, you don't pick it up by the handle if the handle's got a crack. You just sort of instinctively look after it. So I think it's, it's just a, a professional expansion of that, 
really. I see. And in this same line of collecting, and this time from the perspective of the museum, because patchwork gives like, is this sort of window to this like magical world, but it seems to be a really magical world inside of the VNA. What do you think is worth collecting today? Like, what do you think museums should be collecting today for, um, in terms of dress and fashion? Well, as I said earlier, and we all know it's a massive subject and gosh, you know, how do you, how do you do that with a limited budget, limited space? So for me, doing an exhibition is always a trigger to acquire more pieces. So at the moment, we're avidly acquiring contemporary menswear. And it's really exciting because it's a field that I haven't, um, haven't specifically worked in before, at least not in terms of an exhibition. And we, have, the exhibition has been in planning for years, but what's really marvellous is it's sort of coincided with a, a renaissance in menswear. And it seems to me that for the first time for a very long time, I mean, centuries, menswear is actually leading the field in terms of creativity. And would any of the guys in the room like to comment on this? Well, I have a sip of tea. <laughs> um, no, I was thinking before when you were talking about working clothes and how you feel comfortable with working clothes. Um, it's very interesting, and I think this is very related with menswear, how working clothes, like, they turn into something very fashionable now. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's very interesting for a lot of, like, to see, especially, I think, London is full of these, like, working like clothes and jackets and it's like this huge trend and i think that like men that we are like especially interested in this kind of clothing uh, but it's funny how this come from a very like working environment mm -hmm. and working this place. yeah and then it turns into something that is just a trend mm -hmm. and it's yes. fun, you know like car heart it's, it's, yeah. it's basically funded but through that idea of working clothes that are fashionable. Um, I suppose the same is true of sportswear, isn't it? But in, but in a way, I think that's infiltrated women's wear much more. Mm. What, what do you think about, about this? The point you made about workwear as well, actually, I, I reflected mm. on one of the things that I'm most comfortable in, one of the clothes that I feel like my best in. And I, mm. and I, conclusion was wearing a suit because obviously kind of the most quintessential quintessential menswear yes or historically quintessential menswear you can get and that's on the kind of why why i was so comfortable in that as an item of clothing i think it's the kind of it's the kind of the way it makes you carry yourself and it's mm. the way that you suppose project associations etc i'm sure there's all sorts of complicated <laughs> reasons <laughs> why why that's appealing but um yes. yeah it's an interesting thought Christopher Brouard would, would have a view that the suit is one of the most sophisticated um, and complex and uh, functional, but also beautiful, mm -hmm. full of potential. Um, and I've never worn a suit. I don't know. I don't know what it feels like. I don't know. I don't know what it would be like to put on a proper tailored suit that had been made for me. I mean, that must be. I guess it's the equivalent to open job. It's very different. It comes from a very different starting place, doesn't it? The suit, as opposed to say a Dior dress. You used to wear a suit to work every day for many years, no? I did, yeah. And it was um I, I miss it greatly because it was <laughs> the easiest way yes. to look to look quite Smart. Like, yeah, exactly. And I think mm -hmm. kind of it, it's a very easy way to look your best, I think, the suit as an, as one man or one, I suppose, but in my experience, like it's an easy way to look good, and I got to wear it every single day without even to think about it. Right? So, I kind of envy that. Uh -huh. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm very fortunate. Thing to do. Yes, yes. Um, there's quite a lot to be said about you know the, the the swapping of stars and and of course you know women's wear can often be tailored as well, but it's just not quite the same as a suit, is it? Mm. it? Doesn't quite have have that. I don't know decisiveness about it and like that sort of does appeal to me but I'm also kind of quite intrigued by the the confusion around women's wear the the, the, the many thousands hundreds of thousands of possibilities there are for all of us every day mm -hmm. you know it's it's almost overwhelming 
Yeah, and I think that that's why all the, I mean, I'm very interested in, in contemporary fashion, obviously, but I do, if it all gets a bit much, I do go and look at some 19th century dresses, actually, because, you know, they really are, um, they are what they are, and they're not going to change because they've had their day, had their moment, and they're not going to evolve. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's now we're evolving almost in a daily basis. Um, right? Well, I don't, I mean, I think it's very unusual for any of us to wear exactly the same thing every day anyway. And even if we did, we'd be a day older and a different person. So, you know, it's a, it's a it's kind of very unstable in some ways as, as a, a phenomenon, isn't it? It's, it's as unstable as we are, I guess. I mean, we could wear the same thing seven days in a row, but feel different each day. So, it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> That's so what I said. Um, Claire, I'd like yes. to ask you if there is a passage that you would like to read, or if anyone has a suggestion of a passage that they'd like her to read. Yeah, so, yeah. Or, or if anybody's listening um, online, if there's a favorite passage. Yes, if like someone online would like to uh, come up to the microphone or the camera and read your favorite passage, and you guys here, you all read the book already. Um, if there's like a fragment of the book that you would like to read out loud, that would be amazing. Yes, if, if, if they'd like to read it or they would like me to read it, we, we're, we're flexible. Yeah. Is there a specific bit of the book that you remember now? So I do, I have one, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm waiting for other people to go on then. You, you tell me what it says while we wait and see if anybody suggests something better. Mm -hmm. well, I, uh, <laughs> I really <laughs> like. I really like the chapter in which you talk about this mysterious woman, this friend that you had like a sort of, you were sort of infatuated with that you admire so much and you wanted to was, be like her. I was going to say exactly that. Okay. <laughs> like when you, you get ready something and you went to her house. I know, I wasn't invited to have Yeah, I get sorry. You were not invited. <laughs> I was still upset about it and it was like 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, what page is that? I have it here, I'm sure I've separated it. You know that terrible thing is purple of, You know, when you're when you're when you're quite young and you know a little bit insecure and yeah, so what page is 47. 47. Okay. So shall I read this and then if I can always do read another piece if anybody would like that. Okay, so this is this is me kind of being kind of falling in love with somebody. It was a crush. Yeah. It's called Purple Velvet. I felt that nothing but her velvet trousers would do that day and plucked up the courage to ask. They were too big and I had to fasten them with a safety pin and the hems dragged, but still I thought they were a triumph. My friend's charisma and confidence were evident in everything she did, from her handwriting to her sardonic comments, but especially in the way she dressed. I had a crush on her and wanted to wear her clothes. Her face was delicately drawn with a pointed chin, high cheekbones and flushed cheeks, and her eyes were dark and lively with eyelashes that looked painted on, a Reynolds kind of face. Her hair fell to the side like a boy's and she swept it away with her hand, especially when she laughed. She specialized in self-deprecation but that only offered me the opportunity to flatter, reassure. When she entered a room, life suddenly seemed mean meaningful. Her opinions were, I thought, perspicacious and her gossip amusing. And she had an exquisite touch when pouring tea or pushing wildflowers into a jam jar. When she gave me a lift, I loved the way she committed, taking corners with bravado, and putting the handbrake on with a flourish when we arrived, as if that had been exactly what she meant to do with her morning. Once, after we'd all moved to London, I took a carrier bag of trappings and trimmings, velveteen and violets, to her flat. I wanted to give something back to say, I have studied your ways well and think I know how to clothe myself now. But it was a mistake because she was having a party and I hadn't been invited. For years after, I would wonder what she was doing, and if she ever thought of me, never knowing what I'd done wrong. <laughs> so now that this is public, <laughs> has been published, has she reached out to you? No, 
No. Does she know that she is? I don't know. Do you have an idea? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> this was a long time ago. And like a lot of crushes, was probably completely, uh, she was probably completely unaware of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, who knows, people might have had crushes on us and we never knew. So yeah. it doesn't really matter who she is or, you know, she ever recognised herself. The point is, is that I thought that I could fix myself by wearing her clothes. I thought I could become her. And despite the fact that the clothes were far too big, I mean, it was ridiculous. I, was, I looked like, you know, a clown in those trousers. And, and yet I was so convinced that they were so, um, they were so right. And um, it, it was something to do with her knowing herself, her knowing how to dress herself. And I think that's something that I've always struggled with. I mean, there have been a few, moment, a few sort of moments in my life quite a long life now, where I thought, oh, I've got that right, I've got it right. But not many, you know, I think most of the time I, I'm kind of, you know, a third of the way there to how I would ideally like myself to be. But very luckily, once I'm out of the house, I forget about it, I don't care, because I've got work to do, you know, but, <laughs> you know, I think that if, when I was in that state, I was at university, you know, student, you're beset with, you're, you're young, you're you know, home for the first time, you're with an, a huge crowd of incredibly co seemingly confident, confident people, and you, you're sort of measuring yourself against them the whole time. And I think that's just what life is like, isn't it? We're constantly, you know, clocking the room. Okay, where do I stand in this room? Where do I fit? Um, who am I? Who am I? Who looks good? You know, why didn't I do this? You know, all this sort of stuff. So, but most of the time when we grow up, it doesn't matter anymore. We're, we're still reading the room. I'm reading you all. You're reading me. But it's okay. We're, we're over it, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are curious <laughs> things, I'd say. Um, I'm curious, do you think that maybe it was a part of your personality that you wanted to enhance or something that you wanted to hide. Because sometimes we look at pieces of clothing, we put them on because they, we want to feel warm that day because we wake mm. up cold or it reminds us of something or maybe we want to hide our weight because we put on a little bit after the quarantine. What, what do you think this about that? Um, well, I think in that particular case, that, that was very, very intense and very specific and it was actually a, a one-off you know I, I've never had a crush on anybody uh, ever again like that it, it, it but it was very interesting that it did manifest itself through her clothing and that my sort of not being I mean it, I don't think I don't think she was I don't think I'd actually done the thing wrong I think she just didn't think about me I was insignificant so my gift my, my taking these these other you know vintage trappings that I collected together almost like a like a sort of bouquet of flowers made of clothes <laughs> you know from her, um what you know was was a sort of gesture in the dark that was really of no significance to her whatsoever but meant a huge amount to me and I think at that moment I thought I've really got to get over this you know I've got to I've got to um learn learn how to compose myself in some ways <laughs> and and that's just to do with growing up you know you just anyway do we have any we actually have questions from oh. people in zoom yeah. and if you guys have questions as well get ready with your questions so uh this one says hello this is mariam from vancouver canada my question is how you ended up in this job was it something you always dreamed of or something you learned later in life? I still have to read your book, thank you. I think probably working in a museum was the only possible profession for me. I think um, after I left university, I'd, I had gone, had gone to the V&A when I was researching my um, school exams, my history of Bartay level, I went to the National Art Library and I absolutely loved it. And I think that 
when I came back to London, I really couldn't think of anything else I wanted to do except work in a museum. And I never have. I've never had any other aspiration to work anywhere other than a museum, not only any old museum, museum but the V&A. I've been indecisive about many, many things in my life, but not about my work. I, I just knew I found I found the right place to be and that I felt I could contribute to. And I did try other things, but and I guess I'm trying something new with patchwork, but but in a way, you know, it's it's very connected. Mm -hmm. So I think I was just very lucky. I do have um friends who say to me, you know, you're lucky you knew what you wanted to do. And it's it is something but, but it was, it wasn't just to do with the subject matter, it was to do with the building, it was to do with the feeling of, you know, you walk into the V&A or, or any other museum and you you see people who care about the same things you care about. So you, you join a community. I think that's after my disastrous um, crush and, you know, difficult few years, I, I found my community. That's, that's lucky <laughs> and beautiful. <Yeah. laughs> Um, we have now a question from Angela Hurtado. She says, hi, this is Angela from Costa Rica. As a fashion curator, you must have seen some very intricate internal structures in historical or contemporary clothes. Is there any that really caught your eye and why? I, I guess we mean a, a structures of how things are made, the com complexities, or is, is this a pra practical? Yeah, it yes. says intricate internal structures in historical or contemporary yes, clothes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, all the time, clothes are completely fascinating. The insides of clothes are fascinating. That's the first thing. I always look at the inside or you know, look inside the pockets. Um, I think we all do with curious. Yeah. So I, I think that the internal structure of any garment is fascinating, even if, even if it's simple. And my colleague who looks after kimono would say um, that most people think that kimono might be all about the outside appearance but actually for men's kimono often um, the outside was in the late 19th and 20th century the examples I'm thinking of from about the 1920s are fairly dull on the outside but on the inside they've got hidden images so um, because of sort of rules and regulations about colour or imagery and whatnot in, in the 19th century sometimes um, the, the imagery gets buried inside. So I'm very interested in linings. I'm interested in suit linings. I might <laughs> talk to you about this afterwards. I think they're strange because they're, they're, they're sort of, they're attached to a suit, but they, they move independently. And they're not against the skin because then you have the shirt or the waistcoat, but you, you, have, you have an inside and outside, an exterior and an interior. And I have really, Try to research linings and it's quite hard to find any nobody seems to think they're that important mm -hmm. not even the tailors mm -hmm. but actually you've got a sort of twin garment inside the suit jacket haven't you so i think linings are interesting but in terms of complexity of construction i would say some of the very early 17th century doublets and we've got i mean they're really rare we've got a few they're absolutely they're, they're crafted, they're hand stitched, they're lined, they've got um, fancy folded details on, you know, that cover the surface, they might be slashed, you know, they're, they're very, they're very embodied, they're, they're almost, you know, they're off the body, they haven't been worn for hundreds of years, but they still feel quite bodily, and I think that solidity of construction is related to that. Later, um, from you know, the 1920s, 30s, clothes become much more flimsy, they're much more revealing of the body, the, the body takes over. So the, the garment isn't the body, the doublet, the suit, the body becomes visible. Mm. We look at um, Fionne, Madame Grey, Poiré, the body is beginning to be in a much more overt dialogue the carapace of cloth and I think that shift is what really interests me so um yeah it, complexity of construction look inside a 17th century doublet you'll be amazed <laughs> wonderful uh we have a question from Helen 
Helen says, hi, Helen in Derry. Can I ask, uh, do you think that people who profess to follow fashion and ever-changing trends actually appreciate the clothes or are only interested in the next big thing? I ask because when a trend develops and a look is born, that I look that look will not necessarily suit the people who rush to, to wear it, mm -hmm. but they adapt that look simply because it has become fashionable. Yes, it's a good question. It might have been truer of the past than today. I think we're more, more autonomous today. I think we have far more choice, which helps, but I think we're also much more, much more creative in the way we dress. And you might not, I don't know, it's really difficult. Coming down Regent Street this evening, I I was struck by the by the fact that we all think we're individual, but we're all creatures of a crowd. We all may want to express our individuality, and we do through detail, accessories, choice of clothing, but ultimately we are part of a community, a, a, a part of society, and fashion is so embedded in developments in society that we can't help but sign up to it whether it's conscious or unconscious so say in 50 years time there's a photograph of all of us in this room the curator of the future will be able to date us to this year 2021 because like it or not we are really part of a system i don't think that necessarily means abandoning our individuality though i think we can have both i think that one is you can't really escape from but I think in terms of expressing our individuality, as opposed to signing up to fashion top to toe, I just don't think people dress that way anymore. Mm. I think even if you're a couture client, or even if you, even if you're, maybe if you're going to, you know, the Met Ball, you would be top to toe. And maybe if you go to Savile Row, I keep coming back to you about the suit, but if you go to Savile Row and you put on a suit, you're still the owner of that suit. Nobody else fits that suit. So the, you might look similar to other guys wearing suits. It's your suit, it's very particular. So the personality is much more discreet with mm -hmm. menswear, I think. Mm -hmm. I actually read something interesting earlier today um, on Instagram from a, a fashion psychologist I follow. And in terms of trends, she said that like one point of view could be that at the moment, there's such a a bombarding of things coming up and trends coming up that sometimes we need to be told what like what to what we need to be told uh what we like because yeah. there's such a, an amount of stuff there's like there's thing new things coming up every week and yeah. like fast fashion um brands are like stocking new stuff every month and we yes. almost need some yes. someone to tell us what we like and who we are and this like, the big scheme of things <laughs> it's interesting because um, my background is in visual merchandising, and that's exactly what I did for half of my life almost, um, is telling people what they should purchase by putting it at the front of the store because it's on trend or it's something that we want to push. So in a way, it, 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 I mean, it is strategic. The reason why, as you said, we're, we're part of a crowd, but we're individual everyone's purchasing the same things, but wearing them in, wearing them different in different ways. It's so interesting. I mean, I, I, an example sprang to mind, which is, to go back to being a mother, is that um, when my daughter was growing up, one of them from a very early age cared, cared deeply about what she wore and would have an absolute fit if I tried to impose something else on her. And her choices would often be perhaps unsuitable for the weather, you know, or, or would <laughs> involve fairy wings. Um, but I was, I was sort of amazed at the passion, the, the absolute passion. And I didn't, I didn't know whether it was to do with just, a, 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 you know, a, a child who has every right to express their feelings about things going on in life. And I, you know, always feel very strongly that just because we're older, we're not necessarily wiser. And so I would sort of, but so you say, why, why do you want to wear that? And, um, and she wasn't able to articulate it, but she was so certain, so so convinced. And actually, I, in the end, I, I thought, well, you know, why am I trying to make them conventional? Let's let them 
let them express themselves through clothing, even if it's in wearing odd socks, you know, what, what's the problem? So I, I sort of, in a way, learned a lesson from a three-year-old, you know, it was quite, <laughs> um, and I, I've, I, I do think that, you know, through working in the museum and with clothing, I, I just now regard that form of material culture as, a, as a, an offering of many, many possibilities that through simply choosing to buy something that you've put in front of the store and then taking it home, we take ownership of it, it becomes ours. And, and I think that's really important for our well-being and our autonomy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we are, we have one last question from the people in, in Zoom. And we're also almost, well, we're past the time now. Actually. Oh dear. <laughs> so just quickly, Stephanie actually asked the last question, Vanessa, and I wanted to ask you, which is, um, you just mentioned writing patchwork was a new departure in your career. Would you consider writing another book? What can we expect yes, from you? Yes, yes, I, I, I have just started. Yeah, oh. I just started writing another book, but I probably shouldn't talk about it because then I'll think I've done it, you know what I mean? When you talk about things, you think, but I, I, it, it's very important to me to keep going with writing because writing means so much to me and language and words and how they convey meaning or obscure meaning is really important. So the next book is is, is about, um, oh, I'm about to tell you, I must stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, no. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's different, different, different from Patchwork, but, but Patchwork has, has made the next book possible. Amazing. Well, we're looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, you can ask your questions in a second. Mm -hmm. We haven't forgot about you. <laughs> Claire, thank you so it's much for being here today. Uh, we're looking forward to your next book. Yeah. And we hope you, we can have another conversation here with you like this so once the next one is, is um, out. And congratulations you, on Patchwork you. and the awards. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for our partners from something that we're hosting the session today in their lovely studio. And thank you so much to all of you for coming, guys, and to all of you who are watching us from home. Yeah. yeah. Thank you thank for inviting me. <laughs> Bye.